Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. As regular listeners will know, I'm off at the moment due to a recent operation on an existing hand injury, so I need to take a few weeks off for rehabilitation. Knowing how much you look forward to our weekly podcast, I put together some of my most frightening or startling cases today. Tonight, the cases are from both sides of the pond. We start with a battle between a big foot and what I believe to be a new kind of creature in Wales. And then we go across to the US for a terrifying encounter with an unimaginable creature just as fierce and as wild. The case that I'm sharing with you now is very disturbing and I must warn you there are some violent descriptions held within it. The case came into BBR in 2022. It took place in 2021. And it was shared by Robert Manton, the witness himself. He was saved from certain death when, as he put it, a Sasquatch saved me from an absolute giant of a creature that wanted to kill me. This happened when Rob, who's an avid wild camper, picked the wrong evening to camp on a dark night in Wales. And this is what he had to say. Before I proceed, I'll share with you the location of my experience, but I'm not sure you should share it with anyone else. I don't want anyone to go looking for them and get themselves hurt because I believe I was very lucky to walk away from my experience. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for providing a platform for people to be able to share experiences like these, just as I have. And have an experience to share. Hopefully yourself or one of your support crew will be able to fully understand what happened and help me get to grips with it all. This experience was wonderful and terrible, magnificent yet mortifying, something that will stay with me till the day I take my last breath. When I tell you what happened, I want you to take into account that there are some parts of the event that are still a little hazy, dreamlike, almost unreal. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I would have struggled to believe it, but I'll try my best to express what I saw, how I felt, and what transpired. It all happened on the second weekend of April 2021. After a tough lockdown due to the pandemic, I'd made plans with a close friend to go hiking in some of Wales's most beautiful mountains and forests just for a couple of days. After being locked down for so long, it felt like we were celebrating our newfound freedom. Anyway, the day we were due to set off, my friend cancelled on me because he felt unwell and he was worried about the virus. I still didn't want to miss out on all that freedom, so I decided I'd still go on my own, but I thought I'd only stay over for one night. I figured there would be plenty of other people out there, as there are some good biking trails and hiking routes. So with everything packed in my rucksack, I was on my way. It turns out that it isn't as touristy as I thought. I was kind of happy about that, if I'm honest. Late that day upon my arrival, I checked out the visitor centre, I made sure I had a trail map and such, with one final check through the rucksack, I decided I had everything I needed and I set off, a big smile going from ear to ear, I was really happy. The day passed by leisurely, the scenery was breathtaking, I saw waterfalls and wildflowers and sweet yet musky smell was filled the air and it was fantastic, my senses were alive and popping, I felt great. When I think about things now, I'm sure I brought about what happened on myself. In all honesty, I really didn't want to stay at a campsite, so I was being a little naughty when I decided to set up camp deep in the forest along the hillside. At the time, it seemed like a great idea. Would I do it again with what I know? No. But at the time, I had no idea what was to come. I remember at that moment, I was just really happy to be where I was. I started to search for a clearing so I could set up my tent. Somewhere suitable to light a small controlled fire to warm some food, make some cocoa. Everything was going perfectly. I even revisited a childhood treat of marshmallows roasted on a stick on the fire. I spent most of the evening reminiscent of the past, thinking back on times in my life. Recalling my childhood's greatest moments, you know, remembering my first love, my first job. It was a nice evening remembering. I was really happy, more so than I'd been for quite a while if I'm truthful. 
through the evening, I could hear noises around me, cracking of twigs, rustling. There was quite a bit of noise, really. I just thought it was down to the rabbit, the deer or some other woodland creature. I sat up from next to the fire and I started to sip some water over it to put it out before I went to sleep. Safety first, as always. As I started to pour the water on the fire, I had a strange sensation wash over me. A warning feeling that I shouldn't be putting that fire out, that it was such a pretty thing. As the fire went out, for no reason I could think of, I became filled with sorrow and sadness. I couldn't understand this at all. Why was I feeling like this? Then, out of nowhere, I suddenly became very calm, like a reassuring thought had been placed in my mind. Be still, be calm, be safe. That rolled around my mind continuously. But somehow, I knew these thoughts were not mine. They were not my thoughts. I wanted to run. Something wasn't right with this situation, but I couldn't move. I was rooted to the spot. I'm really starting to panic now. And suddenly these thoughts have become questions. Why did you put the pretty fire out? Why are you here? And these questions rolled around in my mind, invading me from many angles. What came next made me near enough mess myself. Whatever this voice was coming from, it said, but not with words, you're okay, little one. You're safe. We'll watch over you. We'll keep you safe. We can see your soul, so we'll protect you from the bad one. You're safe. Strangely enough, I began to feel calm again. I felt safe. I started to think I was having a mental episode of some kind. Little one, be still. The bad one watches you, but we'll keep you safe. Those words rolled around and round in my head. I started to feel scared again now. The warm feelings had gone. I suddenly started to frantically pack up my gear and my belongings and I'm telling myself I'm out here and suddenly from nowhere I start to feel weak, my head's spinning, I keep falling to my knees, I remember holding my head, feeling a pressure I would have sworn was going to make my head explode, I felt sick, something wasn't right with all of this, something wasn't right with me now. Out of nowhere, this low, deep, vibrating rumble came from my six o'clock position. The grumbling sound was growing stronger and louder with every second. This sound was crippling me somehow. I had no strength. I thought I was going to die then and there. And somehow, over the top of the rumbling and vibrating sound, I could just make out, run little one, please run, please go, go. Go, run, run, run. It was impossible to follow these requests. I couldn't move any part of my body. I was completely frozen. I tried to stand up. I got halfway up when boom, I was not completely off my feet again. I was sent sprawling, God knows how far. But if I had to guess, I'd say I was shoved at least 10 feet away from where I'd been. I looked up and I saw something that is impossible. Standing there, not far from me, are two Sasquatch creatures. That was bad, but what was worse was that they were standing between myself and this absolute giant of a creature. That creature is something I couldn't name. It wasn't a Sasquatch like them. I don't know what it was to this day. I tried to get up, but I found I was being held down by an unseen force. As I started to freak out, that calm feeling started to come back. I wasn't scared anymore. I looked down and I saw two biggish hairy arms that were holding me. I spun around, so I'm now face to face with one of those creatures. And it was young, not as big as the other two, much smaller than the unnamed creature. I sensed it was female. When we locked eyes, I could see the warmth and love in hers. She was protecting me. She held my gaze and refused to look or let me get away. She didn't let me look what was going on over my shoulder. I saw only her eyes. The sounds I heard going around me assured me that there was a major battle taking place. And this went on for what seemed like an hour of fighting. 
but it was probably more like five minutes in reality. And then everything went quiet. When things become silent, I realised the violence had stopped and things were now eerie and still. The young female who was still holding me loosened her grip. She let her eyes flick past me and I turned to see a Sasquatch creature that was at least eight to nine feet tall and it was dragging a lifeless body into the deep forest, the creature's body. I'm now seeing one big sash, a big dead creature I still can't name, and another Sasquatch next to me. Where is the other one, I thought. There were three Sasquatch creatures here before the fight. The young Sash must have known my thoughts, and she tapped me with the back of her hand, pointed towards a now broken tree. And what I saw saddened me. There, at the broken part of the tree, was a Sasquatch creature, and she was sat up leaning against the tree and she looked to be in a really bad way then the young sasquatch was in my head again follow me little one she beckoned in my mind i went to grab my backpack and belongings but she grabbed my arm in such a way that words and projected thoughts were not needed come now go please it's not safe i'll show you out i'll show you out i was literally being dragged away she led me to a biking trail and pushed me out onto it. She pointed in the direction that I must go. And as she turned to leave, I reached out and grabbed for her hand and she paused. She let me take her hand and she said to me in my mind, My mother is dying. The others will blame you. Please go. Now. In desperation, I said out loud as well as trying my best to mentally project what I was saying. Thank you. And she smiled. I went to speak more, but she held her hand up to silence me. She stroked the side of my face so gently, so softly. And she smiled one last time and said, Thank you for letting me see your memories and your soul. And then she turned and left. Afterwards, the next week was a bad one for me, as you can imagine. I just couldn't get my head around everything that had happened. So I hit the internet. And I found some channels and these channels stopped me from losing my mind and they've led me to you. As for the Sasquatches, the younger one that was protecting me, you could tell she was female and she was close to my height at six feet tall. And I all understand or I assume that the other two were her parents. Both parents were around nine feet, eight to nine feet tall. Their fur reminded me of the fur chimps have. It was fine, but thick and protective. You could see very defined muscles. For a size example, their thighs were, say, three times the size of my thigh. And all this happened in moonlight, and their fur just looked black to me. It covered them like a chimpanzee, but their hair was very sparse around the chest and the belly area. I don't know what the creature was that came for me. The creature that they killed to protect me. I struggle to describe it even now. It was standing up on two legs and it was as black as the night sky. It was just a bit bigger in stature and height than the adult Sasquatch that was protecting me. I still don't know what I saw. It was just big and clearly wanted to hurt me. I've never gone back to the same spot out of respect. They protected me and they saved me possibly at a great cost to themselves. I'm not so sure they'll be as friendly if I went back. Since then, I've reflected a lot, as you can imagine. These are my following ideas and theories on why, what. My respect for these beings is massive. I know I'm lucky to be alive. I do believe that they're capable of reading our minds and they know our intent. They can see our very thoughts. They look right into your soul. Well, that's what I would assume after my experience. They looked right into the very centre of me and I feel as though they weigh your soul and that determines the experience or lack of experience that you may have. Robert went on to explain, the idea that they can view our memories freaks me out if I'm honest, but I need to know what the creature they protected me from was. I should be dead. 
After researching, I'm honestly leaning towards the kind of skinwalker or shapeshifter, but I'm still learning, so I may be way off the mark. I bottle this whole thing up. I couldn't speak about it. Now I feel I have to. It feels like the floodgates have opened. I need to know what it was. It's like an itch if I can't scratch. Back to the Sasquatch. I firmly believe they talk to us in our minds if they choose to. They can overwhelm our senses. I believe it's a defence method of theirs, he said. But they can use it to soothe you or calm you as well. It all depends on the situation. But they're not the only beings out there. It's a weird feeling to know that a soul can be seen. Well, I say that, but I've been told in the past that humans have an aura around them, a colour. Maybe that's what they see and used to judge us accordingly. And for them to see my memories, they might be able to see what our minds say when we think and we reminisce. I'm thinking that because I was thinking about my past while they were watching me. They could sense it and in turn have a way of understanding it. A way of understanding my memories, I mean. I'm not saying they watched my memories, but they might interpret the feeling within them, maybe. They're very special. Very special. Robert said, The creature that came for me was around 10 to 12 feet in height. I'm guessing as I have no way of knowing for sure. It had two legs, two arms, and it was hairy, but only to a point. It had short hair on its back and its legs, with no hair at all on its arms. Its eyes were a kind of green that I've never seen before. It had big eyes that were deeply set, a very prominent jawline. It was very square. Its nose was more of a bump with two gaping holes for nostrils. I couldn't see any ears whatsoever. Its hands were very human-like, but they were very long too. To the point it looked wrong and out of proportion, if you get what I mean. Its feet were massive and the nail on the big toe was big, almost like a weapon. From what I've heard about dogmen and werewolves, it's not that. It had no snout or dog's ears of any kind. Nothing about it was dog related. That's my experience and I feel a little bit stupid sending this. Well, embarrassed really. At the start of the year, I would never have believed anything like this was possible. And now I've seen them for myself. I can't deny it. I got back to this witness, obviously, and there was a bit of an update. He said, thank you ever so much for getting back to me. Just having someone that believes me and confirms I'm not going mad means so much. I was thinking about staying anonymous, but if I did, I feel I'd be doing my experience an injustice. Something special happened. Something that's not only happened to myself, but others. They are brave enough to come forward, lay themselves bare and speak without fear. If I stayed anonymous, I'd be doing them an injustice too. So feel free to use my name. You asked me, Deb, if I want to see them again, and I feel like the answer should be no. But something inside of me yearns to see them again. I can't explain it, but I know I'm probably not welcome there. That something could happen to me if I did go. I still dream of the one that was badly hurt. I hear the screams, the shouts, the thuds. I can feel the young one holding me tight, shielding me. I try to picture the horrible creature, but my mind won't allow me to. I get a faint picture in my mind and as quick as it's there, it's gone again. I started to wonder if something was done to me in order to make me forget the creature and what it looked like. I don't know for sure. It's just a thought that crossed my mind. Maybe in the future we'll we'll revisit the place and try and give thanks to something. When I say this next thing, please don't think I'm insane. But I think the young one visits my dreams. I wake up from a dream I don't remember, but I can still smell her, like she was in the room with me. Obviously, there's no one in the room with me, but the sensation feels so real. There's so much more to say, to unravel, to understand. I'd be very grateful for help in getting it out of my head, to make sense of it all. Did I do something wrong? Am I to blame for what happened? So many questions fly around my mind. I'm sure you understand that. The whole thing has made me question the world we live in. Like you say, 
if we share this, someone else might come forward. They might have had similar experiences and fingers crossed around the same location as mine. Since I've been researching, I heard about an experience, location excluded, but it was experienced by a physicist. Some of the things he described were very similar, but his experience was a good one. I wonder if it's the same location. I think when I found you, I thought you had this magic wand of truth and knowledge and all the answers to the questions I have. That wasn't fair of me. I'm sorry. I wonder if there are any groups you could point me in the direction of, as I'd love to be able to speak with others who were blessed or burdened with an encounter. I feel I'm becoming a little obsessive, if I'm honest, in my search to find answers, to the point I'm actually thinking of going back. Not because I want proof or validation. I can't describe it. It's like something calling from the back of my mind. So I think I'm going to go back at some point for certain. I did recently get in touch with Robert to see how he was going and if there'd been any updates. And of course, if I hear back from him, I'll let you know straight away. It must have been awful for him to be in that situation. And how must he feel now, you know, when the urge to itch your feet, as I call it, come to wander the woods? That's always going to be in the back of his mind. He's always going to be thinking about that encounter. It's a really hard line to walk, but he has to. He has no choice in it, like me and the others. You don't ask to see what you see, but you see it. For all, this is a short report. The encounter contained within it is one of the most horrifying reports that I've ever come across. I don't know how the family navigated this nightmare, but I hope they found a way of coming to terms with what can only be described as a murder by a canine creature. And it's titled, A Dogman Killed My Grandfather. In 1977, in a rural farming community in the US state of West Virginia, a witness, who was just a boy at the time this happened, shared a startling encounter. He explained when he was young, his grandfather often spoke about large, strange animals that could be seen roaming about the property. This happened so often, the old man took to constantly keeping a gun with him at all times. The grandfather also told the boy to always lock his window at night and to be careful when walking outside if it was dark. One evening, the boy heard a noise outside his window as his grandfather fell asleep in the living room with his gun on his lap. The boy said he could hear a low growling that was coming from outside the window, but he couldn't see anything. He looked, he saw nothing at the window. He then went to get some candy from a bowl in the living room. And that's when he observed a clawed hand coming in through the window. The hand had her palm facing down as it was going to push the window up. The witness clearly saw three fingers on that hand. The middle finger was the longest. Years later, he claimed the fingers reminded him of the claws of the creature in Krampus, specifically the scene where he pointed his finger in the woman's face. On seeing this, he understandably screamed in fright which woke up the grandfather. Strangely, the creature also screamed. The grandfather went into fight mode and proceeded to hit the creature's fingers with his gun. The witness grabbed a knife from nearby and also stabbed at his fingers, which continued to try and get in through the window. At that moment, the grandmother rushed into the room and turned on the outside light, which lit up the yard. The witness could see the creature clearly standing in the window. He even looked into its eyes. He could see the creature clearly standing there. As that light went on, the creature took off. He was running just as the grandfather raised his gun to shoot at it. And according to the boy, the creature appeared to be angry and was growling as it ran. The witness acknowledged that he wet himself during the exchange. And at some point, the grandmother stated that the creature had returned. It's back, she said, which surprised the witness. He asked to know about this comment and they proceeded to tell him that the creature had been seen around the property three years earlier, but it had left. They assumed it had been killed. It had only started appearing again about two weeks earlier. This upset the witness as he'd been playing on the property and he felt he should have been alerted to it. The grandparents told him that in 74, the grandfather was in a deer stand bow hunting when a large creature attempted to climb the tree and entered the stand through the door. 
The grandfather shot at it and stabbed at it, and it was never ending. Eventually, after this to and fro in, the creature attempted to poke its nose and its face through the opening in the stand. And that's when the grandfather stabbed it in the nose. He managed to get a claw through and he slashed the leg of the grandfather. The creature fled after that. The scar was visible on the nose of the creature standing at the window. As well, the grandfather also had a scar on his leg. The grandfather claimed he waited in the stand for three hours before they feeling safe enough to climb down and leave. They'd never heard of a dogman at the time, so they just referred to it as the werewolf. The boy was horrified by everything that had been shared with him, and he struggled to overcome this event and put it behind him. He hoped the creature would vanish again, but far worse was yet to come. Over the coming weeks, there would be dead farm animals found scattered on the property, apparently having been mauled by something very large, One day, when the grandfather failed to show up to pick the boy up from school, he walked home to find the old man dead in his truck, mauled in a similar fashion as the farm animals. The police investigated and came to the conclusion that the man had died from an attack by an unknown animal. That report is absolutely horrifying, but it does bring others to mind and the ongoing increasing activity of animals that are appearing right up to people's homes or trying to enter into them. This reminds me of a couple of reports off the top of my head. One couple who were in the Peak District only last year, a girl and her mum were at home, when something with a long bony arm started to reach up to come in the window. And a family that stayed at Bernabat, when they saw a creature watching them from outside. I want to share with you a report that I often find myself thinking of when a report of a creature comes in from a wild camper. I know the witness through the Pitch Up community and for a very long time, he did not know about me, my experience or the experiences I share with you guys. On a camping trip in Clivelero, he let slip that his last time out alone had not gone well and he'd camped in groups ever since. I explained I'd not only believe him if he shared what happened, but also I could let him know just how many other people had shared a similar story with me. It took him a while, but eventually he rang and we had a long chat. Has he kept a journal and he did the odd article himself on wildlife camping and some of our ancient sites? I felt he might find it cathartic to write out what happened and then I'd share the information with him. So what you hear now is his email written about three years after the event. The wild witness's name is Carl G and he said, Deb, I contacted you after much to in and fro in, as you know I'm a wild camper and quite well known in some circles. To share in this is hard. They didn't call it wild camping back when I started as a boy. It was just a night off the farm in those days. My family ran a beef and dairy farm and it was long hours for not much pay. We always had food and plenty to barter with, but ready cash was always in short supply. In the countryside, people hunt for the food still. and Back then, it was more prevalent. Pigeon, duck, rabbit and hare were a welcome catch. Now it's frowned upon by some, but I was brought up alongside nature and one day I'll return to it. It's all just a circle. I'd go off with my brothers and my friends from around the area. We'd head up to the peaks and down around the reservoir where there was always animal sign and the stream was well stocked so we never went hungry. Some of the lads tailed off and stopped coming all together. Some I still see for the odd pint now and then, but sleeping wilds never left me. It's my one place I feel like me. It frees me. I often use it as food for the soul. I'm known as a primitive toolmaker and I usually show people how to camp in a primitive way without the use of modern tools. But sometimes even I like a few home comforts. In 2014, I was suffering with a chest infection. I'd been cooped up at home for weeks. It was autumn, but the weather was warm enough to get in one more camp before winter, and I could test out and clean out my camping supplies and get that long-awaited job done and pack away my light gear till the warmer months next year. The fresh air had also do my chest a world of good. So I set off for one of my more sedentary spots. It was set within an orchard not too far from the farm 
and with easy parking and access from the road. The farmer's a decent guy, always has a wander over and a chin wag when I pop in. We went to school together, you know, as most families here will attest, we all know each other by one relative or another. I'm not going to tell you the area, as I don't want it spoiled in any way, and after what happened to me, I'm not sure people should be heading over that way either. The orchard was full of different kinds of like apples, hazels, walnuts. I set up my gear and with a bad cold, I had the full kit. My sleeping bag, my tarp and my tent. I got the fire going and a brew on and the farmer wandered over for a chat. He asked me if I'd seen any strange cars or vehicles on my way in or around the area at any point. It was 7am and arrived about 6.15am. I told him no, I'd not passed any people or vehicles on the way in. He went on to explain that for a few weeks now, a number of chickens, eggs and feed had been taken. And he thought it was some wandering tramp or one of the farmhands who were brought in by the picking teams who had felt the need to steal from him. If not, he'd suggest a dog or a cat of some kind, but his barley and his wheat bins had been raided, which would be very hard on your average dog or your cat. And with so many protein sources available, why would they take feed? I told him I'd be there for about 30 hours or so, as I had a job to do on the following Wednesday. So I'd keep an eye out for tonight, and as my tent was tucked under the trees and with the grass so high, you know, they may not see me hidden away in there. I said if I heard anything, I'd start blowing my whistle loudly and alert him. We agreed on the plan and left it at that. I had a bobbin rod with me, so the day was spent foraging, catching for dinner and evening meal. I had a snooze and a wander along the river. It was a good day, everything I needed. I had a small rocket stove with me and I made a cup of tea at dusk. It wasn't too cold either. I went to bed with a good sleepy head on me. All thoughts of this morning's agreement were completely forgotten. I must have nodded off quickly as I awoke with a start. I had no idea of the time, but it was much darker outside. The moon was out so I could see shadows of like the trees in the bushes. I listened, trying to work out what had woken me but I heard nothing. As I lay there, heart pumping, I realised I needed a pee, and that's what had woken me. So I unzipped the tent and the fly, and nipped over to the nearest apple tree, and did what I needed to do. I had my head torch on, and I switched it on without thinking, as I was worried about peeing on my boots. I looked down at my aim, when this feeling hit me all at once. A feeling I'll describe as utter dread. I felt like I was suddenly in the middle of a war and I couldn't see any of the enemy. I knew they were there watching and they could see my every move, but I couldn't see them. It was like hundreds of eyes watching me from the trees. I looked up quickly and I saw eye shine and this eye shine suddenly dropped to the floor and vanished. I was back in the tent like lightning and was stuck between staying and packing up where I remembered the farmer and that I was supposed to be acting as a night watchman, not quivering in my sleeping bag. I lay there, caught my breath, slowed my breathing right down, and made the decision to listen. If I heard anything, I'd blow the whistle loud, but nothing happened. I lay there for what felt like an eternity in silence. I slowly slid my hand into my kit bag, got hold of the whistle, just in case, and as the minutes ticked by, I started to feel stupid. I'd heard the odd rustle of grass, but that could be any animal or bird known to man. I didn't hear anything else for a long time, so I decided to try and sleep. As I was drifting back off, suddenly from nowhere that feeling was back. I felt frozen and scared out of my wits. I felt a movement to the side of my hip, and to my horror, I felt something forcibly pushed under the tarp, under my tent, and under me. It felt like a huge arm thick with muscle and hard and I screamed like a banshee. The arm shot from under me and I kept screaming until the farmer nearly caused his own death by opening my tent. I screamed in his face like a man possessed. When he calmed me down and I'd explained what had happened, I don't think he believed me. I saw his quick glance at the miniature rum bottle beside me but I'd filled it with linctus from a chest and now it looked suspiciously like slow gin. I'd awoken him with me screaming and he'd come running in the hopes of solving his chicken thief mystery. I excused myself 
lit all my torches and lights and packed up as fast as I've ever packed up a tent. I was camping close to Scarfell once when the bad winds happened in 87, 88 and that was terrifying, but this was like nothing I can explain. How on earth can an arm that thick and full of muscle not only pick me up like I weighed nothing, but also get right up to me without me hearing a thing? I am so glad I have never been in Carl's position. I spent some beautiful nights in the tent under the moon. There is nothing and no other way better to unwind than to fall asleep to the sound of rain or a trickling brook, horses neighing or the wind as she moves through the land. But what if beneath that, all the time you're lying there, a horror creeps closer and closer to you? What would you do? As you know, I've wild camped often and I love to be outdoors in nature. But it's not easy picking a place to camp if you know of as many encounters as I do. Not only here in the UK, but also worldwide. The idea of being in my tent tucked up for the night to encounter a creature staring at me in the night is just something unimaginable. What would you do? Stay as calm as you can or run for your life as fast as you can. I suppose it's a personal choice. One you make in the moment. As a quick example, what would you have done if you were in Jeff's shoes when exactly that scenario happened to him? It was big and it was standing over our tent. Jeff Smith from Arizona said, two friends and I had travelled to the Huachuca Mountains of Cochise County for some hiking and camping. We were limited on where we could go that year due to the extensive wildfires. Having been blocked from going up Car Canyon, we drove down much further into Miller Canyon, where we were able to get off the beaten track, a bit of a path that went up a bit steep. The three of us slept in a small dome tent that we pitched about 20 yards off the dirt road. We did not see another car up on the road where we were that night. I awoke in the middle of the night to my friend sitting up in his sleeping bag yelling. The ceiling of our tent was mesh and he could look through it and see the sky. And when his yelling awoke me, I asked him what was going on and he told me that he just saw a Bigfoot. I kind of smiled but I could see the fear on his face. And he went on to say, Dude, I saw it. I know what I saw and I still remember it. I wasn't dreaming. It was just as vivid as when it happened. I looked up through the tent and I saw its face looking at me. The moon was bright and behind where it was standing, you could see it illuminated. It made it hard to distinguish facial features though. I could see a perfect silhouette. Its head was pretty long and it didn't really have a neck. Its head seemed to just merge with its shoulders. It was big, at least eight feet, and it was standing over the tent like it was leaning forward and looking through the moon roof netting. I could see what looked like the whites of its eyes. We stared at each other for at least 30 seconds before it was gone. Jeff said, when the Sasquatch moved away, my friend yelled in fright, we did not attempt to leave the tent or go in pursuit of it. I have 100% trust in my friend. We joke around quite often, but I can attest that he is not joking about this. I believe his account to be authentic. Jeff went on to say, I myself have been hiking in the Wasar Mountain of Utah and had the distinct impression, almost tangible, that I was being observed. The feeling caused me to stop and look around but I saw nothing. That feeling persisted, so I started to sing while I walked. I'd been alone in the woods before, but this feeling was unique. I was bushwhacking through an aspen grove at the time, in an area which I'm now aware has been something of a hot spot for sightings of Bigfoot. I've since learned that this feeling of being watched is a common phenomenon that often precedes sightings. If I'd known this then, I would have been more vigilant. Jeff. And what would you have done in Jeff's position? I don't know what I would have done. I can be honest. It reminds me of a case here in the UK of the Wardstone Werewolf that happened not too long ago on the night of a meteor shower when he was camping in the forest of Boland up against a rock with no tent. 
and as the fire was lit, he heard the noise of sheep being worried below. And soon, he saw something watching him from the outside of the fire that would take on the position of what he called a commando or a soldier. It would literally belly crawl to its next position where it would sit hunched. And it did that almost till daylight and he too had to choose whether to run for his life or to sit and wait it out. And he waited it out. I wonder how many more cases like that there are out there. I have some more. And if you're interested in them, just check out my channels in the links below. It'll take you some places with exclusive content. So until next time, good night everyone.